Today, we're excited to have Professor Regina Nuzzo with us. As a deaf woman, Regina's journey up has been anything but easy. And from earning her PhD in a male-dominated field to writing about sex science for a major newspaper and learning how to hear new sounds with a cochlear implant, Regina has consistently blazed her own trail in the pursuit of her passions. In this keynote, Regina will share her story. She'll share the challenges she faced along the way, lessons she learned, and advice she has to offer. Regina is an expert in storytelling using data analysis and statistics. Her work has been featured in Nature, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Reader's Digest, New Scientist, Scientific American, and more. And currently she's teaching statistics in American Sign Language at Gallaudet University, the world's only liberal arts college for deaf and hard of hearing students. Thank you for being here, Regina. Um, and I'll now pass the controls over to you after which we'll have a Q&A session. So please feel free to continue to submit questions. Regina, please go ahead and present. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jackie, for the invitation to come and speak. I'm honored, I'm delighted. You know, I thought about today, any words of wisdom and pieces of advice, and I'm not sure I have too much wisdom, but I do have a story to tell and some of the things I decided to talk about for this story, it's really the first time I'll be talking about them in public. So I really appreciate that we have this lovely space for me to do that. And thank you all for listening and being here for that. So as Jackie said, I am deaf. What, is, what does that even mean, deaf? I never know how to identify myself, how to label myself. Is it deaf? Is it hard of hearing? Is it hearing impaired? Is it some of the cochlear implant? Is it a cyborg? You know, it's, it's not easy. I get it. We need labels. We need identity. In the past, we all would have known each other. You would have known me. We'd be in the same neighborhood and you would have more nuanced information about me. What, what did I hear? Did I grow up signing? Um, what what does that even my background you would have you would have that and i would have that about you so i get that we need to have these these categorical labels um and identity but that so makes it difficult especially when they're, they're categories when they're these rigid categories so my question is well deaf compared to what or to whom right um i'm a statistician i got my PhD at Stanford and statisticians are always saying, well, compared to what, who's your control group? Um, and, you know, because compared to animals like dogs and cats and bats, we are all very hearing impaired. Did you know, I discovered this when I was looking at uh, cats can hear the electrical outlet when you plug in like your hair dryer or a lamp or something before you even turn it on, they hear that buzzing. They have an immense range of hearing that we don't have. So I'm wondering whether cats are always, you know, going around secretly pitying us for being so deaf and not being able to hear all the beautiful things in the world that they can hear. And, you know, cats, it's, uh, it's probably true. So for me, I was born with about half the hearing that most babies would, and I could hear the low frequencies, but not the high frequencies. I could hear, that means I could hear things like um, dogs and thunder and vowel sounds but I couldn't hear the consonants, the high-pitched sounds, um, rain, birds, I couldn't hear birds. So birds was actually the way that they found my hearing loss. Um, I was about four and my mother said, hey, did you know that the bird's beautiful this morning? And I said, birds, mom, birds don't make a noise. I'd never heard birds. I didn't know they made a noise. So um, that was how they caught it. This is my audiogram. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to read an audiogram. Well, this is an example of my audiogram. Um, perfect hearing would be a straight line up at, the, up at the top on the zero hearing loss. Um, and you can see where mine was going down. So everything under the curve, I was able to hear. This is my audiogram when it was probably about six or so. So you can see that I had the low frequencies, but I pretty much had none of the high frequencies, including the birds. 
The problem is that those high frequencies, those consonants are where so much of the information for words are. So um, might, tight, light, fight. Uh, if it's important that I distinguish the difference between them, I couldn't hear them, it was just I. And if it was in background noise, I would lose it completely, just gone. So this is a, my audiogram when I was about 20, you know, I was losing hearing over time. The, the graphics are nice. Uh, they explain why I was able to learn how to speak because I had these, you know, these low frequencies, these vowels, um, but I would mispronounce or not pronounce the high frequency things, things that I didn't hear or I couldn't see on people's lips. It's also kind of fun to look at um, what's called a spectrogram. So again, you don't have to worry about um, reading it. Um, the, the, this is a spectrogram of someone saying 19th century, Fun, difficult to pronounce. So the frequencies are along the y-axis and time is along the x-axis. And the, the colors, it's a heat map, uh, show the intensity or the volume. So this is what a person with normal hearing would hear, um, kind of all of these colors coming forth. They would be able to hear that. Um, when I was a kid, this is, this is what I heard, like blankness, and then a tiny little bit. I made great use of that tiny little bit of sound. Um, I was really good at guessing, um, reading people, kind of understanding what they might be saying and bluffing and getting by. This is uh, my spectrogram after I lost more hearing. It's about when I was 20, so it, it was just going down and down. And, you know, my parents didn't really know how much I was struggling or how much I was missing. Uh, they sent me to normal school, no sign language, no special accommodations. And, you know, phys philosophically, I find it kind of interesting to look back because I didn't know what I was missing either. I think it's this way with a lot of things. How do you know what you're missing if you've never experienced it before? Like you all are not going around sad and depressed because you're not hearing what your cat is hearing. I wasn't either. I just didn't know. There was this whole other world and theoretically I knew, but you know, it wasn't, wasn't really. Not until several decades later that I as an adult middle age, got a cochlear implant and then was able <clears throat> to get more sound and to really realize how much I was missing and have so much sympathy for my younger self. Um, it's, been, it's hard, it's hard. A deaf friend of mine described it as doing crossword puzzles in real time where you, constantly having to fill in the blanks and the, you know, the clues and do these mental gymnastics or like your giant machine learning algorithm, except I wasn't supercomputer. I was just a tired, you know, little girl. So I would go to school every day and not hear my teachers and look down at the book on my lap and just read. It's probably a good way to get an education or not horrible. Now we'll go to the lunchroom, you know, cafeteria and the cacophony of kids shouting and talking to each other and building connections. And I, I just, I couldn't understand a thing. So I was a little emotional. I couldn't understand. So I was, I was so isolated being in that situation. I, was, I didn't really have friends. Um, and then to top it all off, I would go home and then pass out with fatigue, take a nap, just on the bare minimum, you know, of trying to get by. Still, I loved school. I loved it. I mean, it's no surprise that I gravitated towards math and reading because these were things in black and white. They didn't, they didn't change. Things in the air were just not reliable. They were coming in, and, you know, they, it was like, um, it's like they weren't real. They were ephemeral, but things I could read and see. Um, so, you know, thinking about math and reading, have you ever in your life realized themes in your life, but only in retrospect, you didn't realize kind of at the moment what was, what was guiding you or what was there? 
one of the themes for me has been communication. And it's precisely because I could never take clear communication for granted because I was so um, confused all the time by the world and left out and, you know, all this information. I studied engineering at University of South Florida and um, it, was, it was hard depth wise, um, big auditoriums. I couldn't even read lips now. Um, got a little better when I was in the upper class, but you know, then often I was the only female in the class. And I think a lot of you know what that experience is like. Not a whole lot of fun, not nurturing or warm. I didn't have a whole lot of support in that way. But I was drawn to statistics. And I think part of it, again, part of the theme, because statistics does, in a sense, what I was doing, what I do every day, which is take this mass of complicated, messy, incomplete information that you're getting from the world and somehow parse it, figure it out, figure out what the universe is trying to tell you, what it means, like what reality is underneath all of that. And do something with it. Um, in some ways, that's a terrific metaphor for my, you know, my hearing loss and, and how I was dealing with, with deafness. Um, so I went to uh, Stanford for my PhD and in statistics. And I think this is one of these, again, one of these examples of the theme or about me taking pieces in my life, you know, what it is and obstacles or brokenness or feeling of brokenness and not being something I need to overcome or embrace or something, but in a whole different direction, taking it and creatively integrating it into my life, into who I am uh, in ways that make sense to me, you know, and they are personal and universal. So I came to Stanford for my PhD in statistics, and that was life changing, I have to say. And that's not just because I'm speaking to people at Stanford. It was amazing. I mean, it was hard. It was very hard. Um, now it's just a whole another level of hard. Um, we all suffered. My cohort was brilliant and everyone suffered, you know, amazing there. Um, still good friends with a lot of them. I got, I got through with a lot of support from the people that I met at Stanford. Still good friends, collaborate with them. At Stanford, you know, I didn't, there's no textbook to read. Um, the faculty were the textbook. They were better than the textbook. <laughs> there was nothing to read. You needed to get everything from them. So it was, um, it was challenging. My hearing loss was also going down fast um, at that time. Maybe because of the stress, I don't know. They call my type of uh, hearing loss a ski slope hearing loss um, because it kind of resembles ski slope and you can just see year after year these audiograms that that slope just crumbling and rotting away and eroding it was tough so it was at stanford that i got my first pair of hearing aids they didn't work very well in the 70s you know growing up and i had an odd type of hearing loss so i got my first pair of hearing aids that was great i also learned about assistive technology and that was the first time that i found out about real-time captioning with a transcriptionist like we have today, a human would sit and do the phonetics of what they're hearing and words would magically appear on the laptop between us. So I requested that for my weekly biostat seminar and um, that was great. Some of the professors would come and sit next to me, kind of look over my shoulder. I think these sorts of things, universal design, you know, captions help a lot of people. You don't need to, you know, have a deafness. Um, I also started learning American Sign Language at Stanford with a uh, fabulous instructor, Kathy Haas, who is deaf. Um, she was amazing. It was my first real exposure to deaf culture and ASL and all of that. I'd been so busy exhausting myself trying to fit into the hearing world that I had never really explored this this, you know, this other thing. And I was not a beautiful signer, but Kathy is like the best instructor. She gave me my sign name and 
just kind of, she planted a seed that, very gentle seed, um, very patient, that didn't sprout until later. And I think sometimes that's what we need, right? Someone is just going to plant a seed, not push, not try to influence, just plant a seed. And I feel like for Kathy, that was me, but it, it took years before that really sprouted. So I graduated Stanford and was doing a postdoc at McGill University. But I still had this communication thing on my brain. I really wanted to communicate and write about statistics. I had taught at Stanford. I loved it, but I wanted to connect with a broader audience. And a friend of mine was doing the science communication program at UC Santa Cruz. And um, basically, they take scientists and in nine months, turn them into science journalists. Um, so it's great. I went, I did that. I loved it. It's a little bit of an odd career choice, though, on the face of it. So to be hearing impaired and yet do a job that requires you to listen um, for a living. So I had to learn how to be creative about that. I worked at the Monterey Herald um, throughout my, my time in the school there, and I, I much preferred to do the stories about ladybugs and sea lions and grunion fish on the beach um, than the ones with people because it was easier to interview the ladybugs. Um, I went to this desalination town hall and, um, you know, covering it for the Herald and supposed to come back with quotes of what people said at the, at the meeting and I couldn't hear a thing. I, I came back with a notebook that was <laughs> nearly completely blank. Luckily, I had a wonderful editor who was just was very calm and looked me square in the eye and said, do we need to kill the story? That would be a bad thing, killing the story. Luckily, we were able to cobble it together, um, but that that was not for me. Um, I preferred doing other things. And the, the thing is, I was, I was trying too hard to be like other people right or the, you know a model of what a journalist is supposed to do instead of um being more like me with all its you know wonderful um imperfections so there's a thing um what is it called kintsugi golden repair and it's this idea that you know, you have you have something that's broken, but rather than these pieces, but rather than getting rid of it, just tossing it out, um, you repair it with this lacquer that's tinged with uh, shiny gold, platinum or silver or gold or something. And you have something that is beautiful and strong in its own way. And yes, it doesn't look like everyone else or do things like everyone else, but it is itself. It is its own bowl. And that was what I needed to do with journalism. Um, it, it, I don't want to call it a secret superpower, but it um, it was mine. It was, it was those bits that I was most missing or deficient on that became my source of strength. Um, so I, I, in, Instead of being, you know, this perfect journalist, I was a journalist who could not hear very well, but I was very good at listening. And what does listening mean? So I learned to listen in other ways. I learned to listen just for the couple of good quotes. I didn't need all the quotes. Or I realized I could listen better when I was interviewing someone. I did all my research ahead of time. So I read everything, you know, written by a researcher. Uh, before I went to interview them. And then I'd be able to ask them all the great questions uh, that other journalists may not have even thought to do because they hadn't needed to, you know, compensate and, and do this other thing. Or um, a writing instructor said that he thought that I noticed things in the, um, in the scene that maybe other people wouldn't, how... Uh, someone was nervously twirling their chair or, you know, what they were doing. And these are great color details that you can put into a story. So this, that, that was me. Um, I, I had fun with it. Um, Jackie said I ended up writing for LA Times and somehow I ended up writing a big feature story on the science of orgasms, which you can imagine might 
been popular, especially at the time. It was a little racy at the time, but it was it was straight up science. So then I ended up writing a lot about sex science for LA Times. I was on the Today Show talking about how to use evolutionary psychology research tricks to get a date at a holiday party and the silly things. But it was it was a lot of fun for me. That was that was um, that was me. You know, that was taking these pieces and creatively integrating them into who I wanted to be. And I've done that with other things, too. So um, after I finished the writing program, I came to D.C. and worked for the National Academy of Sciences as a writer. But I really wanted to write for a general audience, and I missed teaching. And Gallaudet, as it happened, is in D.C., and had a position open, tenure track, assistant professor in mathematics. And for those of you that know, don't know, Valida is unlike any other place in the world. The only university that is set up expressly for deaf and hard of hearing students. And um, so there was new assistant professor um, taking on this challenge. And it was strange because here at Gallaudet, um, I was no longer hearing impaired. Now I was sign impaired. Um, I knew sign language. Kathy did a great job, but it was nothing like the, the fluency. I was working with faculty who were second, third, fourth of generation deaf. They were native in the ASL, and it's really hard to go from you know rudimentary survival skills to let's talk about advanced statistics. Um, but but I loved it. I love the challenge because again, it's just communication. I love communicating complicated ideas. It's basically what I do as a journalist. And I love the challenge of doing this in a, in a language. ASL is just so beautiful, but it is not like any other language. It's spatial. It's four-dimensional. It doesn't have vocabulary for things. So how are we, how are we going to talk about correlation? What sign are we going to use when we talk about correlation? What does it mean? What does correlation really mean? I love that. That has been fun. And I think... Just like being deaf has made me a better journalist and a better listener, I think that teaching in my non-native language, and you know, this amazing but very unlike written or spoken English language, uh, it's made me a better teacher and a better communicator. I've had to be creative and force me to think, you know, about these sorts of things. It also got me down this path of developing this new subfield of quantitative communication. So, how can we? take numbers and data and talk about them in ways that bypass the brain, because our brains are notoriously bad at numbers, and just get right to our gut somehow. To me, this is it's kind of embodied. It's the same thing as it's kind of what ASL does. Anyway, so I have one more example on this personal level of how this creative integration has worked in my life. And I, I don't even know if I can take credit for it. It's more like what my brain did. So um, about seven years ago, I decided after a lot of research, I wanted a cochlear implant. I wanted to give it a try. I wanted to hear birds. I wanted to hear birds for the first time in my life and lots of other things, the S sound. Um, so um, I'm happy to talk more about the cochlear implant, you know, in the Q&A. But basically, it's this, it's, I call it, I named mine, tiny brain computer, tiny. So you have a, a tiny mini computer that, um, bypasses your damaged cochlea and directly stimulates your auditory nerve, you know, leading to your brain. And uh, thousands pulses, you know, electricity, thousands of times per second. That's what's happening right now. And amazingly, your brain is supposed to make sense of all of this. So I did this as a middle-aged adult, and, you know, I didn't think my brain, um, I had no idea if my brain would be plastic enough um, to be able to make sense of it. So you have to wait three weeks before you're turned on, activated. And I, you know, went in the room. You probably have seen videos of, you know, kids sitting there, um, and uh, turned it on. And she said something. I don't even know what it was, and it sounded <laughs> so bizarre. It was not even human. It was like alien things being beamed in my head. It was, it was so. And then I started laughing, and then I heard that, <laughs> which sounded even funnier, and then that made me laugh more. So it was um, a very interesting thing. It was also very painful, though. So when she did the S sound, finally the S sound, I was, I was ready. I was going to get it. 
it, um, I didn't hear it. It was completely silent. Um, I felt it and I saw it. It's like this bright white icicle being, needle being pierced through my brain, but I did not hear the sound, like completely silent. I know what sounds sound like. It was this way with all these high frequencies. So SH sound sounded like, um, I mean, it looked like, felt like, didn't sound like anything. It uh, felt like an, an iceberg. So it was, uh, all the high frequencies, so I had synesthesia, synesthesia. Um, I never had that before. It wasn't until like, I got activated that all of a sudden now, um, all the, you know, all the, the vowels that I had before, those low frequencies, they, uh, they came through as like colors, muddy colors and uh, earth tone colors and all the high frequencies, the ones I had never heard and the ones that maybe I had heard, you know, when I was much younger, they came through with um, like these light chrome, this beautiful chrome edging around this, this muddy middle, bright and shiny, it felt like a cool breeze. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of it, right? I had that synesthesia. So those of you that have maybe studied a little bit about neuroscience probably have already guessed what's likely to have happened. My brain, as a young child, never had exposure at all to those high frequency sounds. And brains are very thrifty. That was valuable real estate. And it was not going to let that just go vacant. Um, so it was likely remapped by the visual and the somatosensory parts of my brain that were kind of next door. Um, only now, as a middle-aged adult, I was telling my brain, no, nope, we're going we're gonna to do sounds. Um, it would be like, well, first of all, I got so much extra sound, it was like you hearing now what a bat hears. That's how much extra sound that I got. Um, but imagine, okay, um, what, does, what does ultrasound sound like? It's hard for you to imagine, right? Um, Imagine that all of a sudden overnight you, you were able to taste it or, or kind of see it or feel it, but you couldn't hear it. It was um, the strangest thing. So it was, it was frustrating also um, because I wanted to be able to parse words and I wanted to hear the S sound and I can't and all these high frequencies, the consonants. So I would just sit with, you know, my app, I would say a word over and over and I have to guess what it is, you know, fight, tight, might. And um, the more I clenched and the more I tried to force my brain into hearing those high frequency sounds, making them work, um, the, the worse like, it got. And I worked very hard at this. I studied a little bit about neuroplasticity. And so I um, played games with myself to reward myself. I did it while exercising. I had, I was into this. I was completely into this and because I, I wanted it to work. And I also was curious, what, what is it like? What, what's going on with my brain? So I eventually discovered that I couldn't clench and tell my brain what to do. Um, it was, it was just going to do what it was. So I learned to somehow get into this state where I would feel for the sounds. So if it was, um, the word was game, I would, I would hear G at this, um, this kind of muddy thing with, uh, it's like a little like a little crown or a little cap of, of gold on top. I know it's weird, but um, so when I was, if I would hear game, I wouldn't know if it was name or name, but if I, if I knew that, it, if I could feel that it had that, that little golden crown on top, then I knew, okay, that was game. And so this is a bizarre way to learn how to hear because Again, it's like tasting. You have to taste for your sounds instead of hearing it. You have to meld these two things together. But this is what my brain gave me because my brain did this golden repair. I think it's really, you know, beautiful because this is actually a great visual metaphor for what it did. It took all these, you know, muddy kind of things, you know, this broken plate and edged it all in, in gold and stitched it all up and um, made it, you know, its own 
thing. And it was, it was beautiful. Um, eventually, um, my brain and I got along um, and synesthesia started to fade, the, you know, the lightning bolts and the, the crazy things uh, started to fade. In some ways I miss it. Um, I'm still able to get, uh, get that feeling back again of, of listening to music and just, um, and just crying, even silly music, because it had all these ornate little visual patterns to it or listening to someone speak and it was like a, a cool refreshing breeze was over everything because all those high frequencies I, I see them as being cool and crisp i don't know so um i went from not being able to participate in conversation at all in a noisy situation like hearing absolutely nothing to being able to survive you know it's not perfect um, nothing's perfect, right? My, my brain does what it does and, and that's it. Um, but, but it's okay. I made it, I made it me. And I think that's what's important. So, you know, thinking, okay, well, how, how would I wrap up all this? I said, no words of wisdom, but three things maybe, um, one could take away from this. Um, one is that assembling these pieces, you know, in your life creatively, integrating them creatively. Um, it's powerful, um, difficult, but, but powerful. One of the most powerful things you can do. And number two, it's at those, those, those bits that seem most broken um, or most damaged or most missing, those are actually the parts that are the most beautiful and then the strongest and a source of strength, if you can see them that way. And three, just, I think we are all capable of so much more than we think we are. So, thank you very much. Hi, Regina. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. This was really moving and inspirational, and we really appreciate your vulnerability and talking about your story in such detail and sharing with us your journey. Um, and as you and I were talking about earlier, it just feels so much more important now um, to share that human side of the journey and to be able to share that with everyone and, and have that connection. Um, to everybody in the audience, please continue to submit your questions through the box below the video and we'll begin our Q&A portion of the webinar today. We have some really great questions that have come in for you, Regina, um, during your talk. And I want to start with the first one that I feel um, really kind of sums it up and, and is a good one to start with. Um, you've been asked, how have you found the strength to be so open and vulnerable about your story today? I think that is an excellent question. How have I found? I don't know. I um, I was invited to be here and I, I did it. Um, sometimes that's all it takes. I feel like this is this is a safe space to be doing this. I, I do I do want to say that. Um, I don't I don't know you all and everyone who might be watching this later. I I don't know you, um, but. Uh, I love the idea that this has come together as a, as a community where people support each other. The other thing is that I didn't have anyone telling me things about this when I grew up or even for most of my life. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's hard if, no, it's easier if you have other people's stories, even if they're not exactly like your own. And I've been talking about deafness, I should say, but I think all of this is a metaphor for whatever thing is your thing. Everyone has a thing and we all have multiple things. Um, and so the idea that I can, I can share a little bit of that and maybe other people can take tiny little bits of that away. And so in a way that's supporting my, my younger self that was you know, so sad and alone and confused. But thank you for the question. Thanks, Regina. Um, the next question is facing so many challenges in your journey. Is there anything in particular that kept you so motivated and persistent in achieving your goals? And um, do you have any advice or insight to share for other women facing challenges in achieving their goals? 
Mm. Oh, wow. So, th you know, just solve all the problems right now. <laughs> just um, go ahead. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, You know, when, when I was at, at Stanford, we had a 50th anniversary reunion for the staff department and all these alums were coming back and hanging out. And I was talking to a guy who was close to retirement. I don't even remember his name. And I said, any advice for, you know, a young person starting out? And he said, have your own career, the career that you want, not the career that other people want you to have or think you should have. And he said he always regretted that he didn't that he followed expectations. And um, that actually stuck with me. So I'm just gonna pass that one along again, um, that it's, um, it's difficult to step off that path and do something different and to strive and work. But in a way, what alternative do you have? Trying to be someone else? Like that has never worked, right? So mm -hmm. while it's harder to be yourself in the end, that's the only thing you really can be. Right. And finding your own path along the way. There you go. There you go. I know it's right. <laughs> but true. <laughs> um, another question that came through, and I thought this was really interesting um, with relation to the pandemic, is how has the pandemic affected the deaf community? And are there widespread changes across work and education that have helped and or hindered the community during the pandemic? Oh my gosh, you have another hour or two because we can do that <laughs> yeah, for a long time. Um, first of all, there's oral deaf community, people who don't sign, and then there's signing deaf community. And I feel like I have, you know, a foot in both worlds. Um, masks are really, really tough. And um, for sign language or for lip reading, um, we're, we're cut off from people and when you can't hear or can't hear very well, and I think everyone just in general, we're social animals, we're primates. We want to be able to read a person and all their emotions. And um, I'm not complaining about mask mandates or, you know, it's not a political thing, but just um, that has been hard. Um, not being able to see people in person, you know, even through this, mm -hmm. I'm trying to look at the camera, but we're not making eye contact, right? There's something about eye contact that's very human um, that we're missing. Right good things is that we have captioning you know zoom now we can work from home and i have captions for my calls and it's just it's amazing the fact that we have this so that has been good i'll just stop there because again i could go forever you can uh, please email me <laughs> if you want if you want to chat more about that <laughs> and um so a follow-up question that i felt um was related to that actually is um Kind of when things are challenging so in some of these situations where you may or may not um, have what you need um, in these conversations these conferences these meetings um, when things are challenging how do you keep your energy level up to keep going and thriving um, beyond your challenges keep going and thriving you said mm -hmm. is, is that what you said you're thriving yes <laughs> Just check it. Yeah, um, you know, I feel like the, uh, support really helps. Um, and having that, that small community, a small protected, safe community mm -hmm. where you can come and, um, you know, just complain and get commiseration and say, come on, am I the only one who's feeling this way? Or I'm so exhausted. I just can't move. I can't you know, do anything. Having that safe space where you can do it. Um, in the olden days, we'd have a community, right? It, like physically there. So we don't have that. But the great thing now is that we can connect over great distances and asynchronously and get that sort of support. Um, but I'm not going to lie. Struggle is horrible. It's hard. Just because I'm sitting here talking to you about it <laughs> doesn't mean I'm actually any good at it. For those of us who do not have a hearing challenge, is there anything that you've witnessed that we take for granted? Um, I know you talked a lot about the sound of birds. Um, so I think that that was probably very important oh, to you or significant. Um, so is, in other words, is there an opportunity that we may be missing um, or mm. that we feel like we may be taking for granted? Oh, everything. You know, this is, this is my point about once I realized 
Um, we're all hearing impaired. I, I would love to hear what a bat hears or a cat. Or did you know we can't hear low frequencies because the sound of the blushing, the, the blood rushing through our vessels would drive us crazy. So we just have this narrow view of the world. But compared um, to people, right, who have even less hearing maybe than you do, um, definitely birds and music and um, being able to have conversations um, and uh, do something else at the same time. So if you only have your eyes and you can't rely on your ears, uh, I can't multitask. I have to give you my full attention. Um, so I can't just be doing something else or listening to a podcast or you know, talking on the phone. Um, so right. in, in a way it's, it's good because I can't multitask, but um, in, you know, the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. It would be nice to be able to multitask. Um, what are ways that you've advocated for yourself um, when you needed more information to do your job, whether that's at school or work? Um, and do you have any advice as far as um, advocating for oneself in those situations? It's a great question. Um, after I got my cochlear implant, I got a new experimental kind. I was a part of a clinical trial. and. Um, I did a lot of research on how I thought it should be programmed, mapped. And mm -hmm. uh, the way that the default didn't really work for me. And um, I had to be very, very persistent with my audiologist and say, I know, just humor me. Let's just do it anyway. Um, and kind of keep shopping around until I was able to find that. Um, I think polite but persistent. Um, because if you're not advocating for yourself, other people are not. They're not going to intend, you know, to run roughshod over you, but people are busy and um, you need to be that small voice constantly standing up for yourself. So I think what would I do if I were advocating for someone else, especially someone younger or more vulnerable? What would I do? I would, I would fight for them. And that's the same compassion I try to bring for myself. I, I, we have a couple of questions here that are, are related. Um, so I'm gonna kind of put them together here, but um, one person asked what your advice would be to women who have um, challenges and may feel isolated in some way. Um, and there was another question regarding, um, you know, any mentors or sponsors that showed up along the way to help you. And so I think that kind of ties into what you were just saying about having that like support system um, do you yeah. have any thoughts on that or or advice, suggestions? Yeah. It's so hard. I was not trained how to do that growing up in my culture and in that generation and just where I was. Florida engineering, they were not big about women's empowerment at that, that time in that area. Um, so I didn't get practice doing it. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's like anything else, finding the right fit. Um, so you can try to reach out to other, um, you know, women. I know that this group has a slack, right? So trying to reach out to people that, that might be good for you to go offline and create some more support. And if it doesn't work out for whatever reason, then there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you, you just need to have that magic clicking. So I think, um, a desire to do it and, and to realize that, it's, it's not like it's just magic. And then I found a mentor and they were just standing in the street and I picked them up and that was that, right? Um, it doesn't work that way at all. I think after the fact, it's very easy to make it seem like it was, you know, simple. I think in, in reality, there's a lot of trial and error and just trying people, approaching them and willing to be vulnerable and, um, and stick yourself out there. And, willing to be just wholeheartedly supportive for another person. So of course, the idea of a support is not just what I'm going in there to give, but you give um, by, uh, you get by giving as well. That's, um, mm -hmm. that's the whole 12 step motto, right? We, we help other people by telling our stories and helping them. Um, we also benefit. And then it, do you have any, um, any practices that you use, like goal setting or working with your mentors or coaches or mindfulness or anything that's helped you um, in your direction to, to overcome some of your challenges? Like, can you share with us some of your practices um, when you're yeah. feeling like you are challenged? Um, yeah. 
um, the chocolate count. Um, <laughs> chocolate counts. Chocolate, <laughs> chocolate. A lot of exercise, you know, healthy habits. Um, I, I read once a, a famous writer, I'm forgetting who, a female writer, said, I make my life very, very orderly so that I can be wild and creative and chaotic in my work. Um, and that was that was part of her signature style. And I like that a lot by creating these you know, these boundaries and this regularity, then it gives us freedom to be uh, crazy within that. Um, I'm also a big fan of paying people money to help um, to uh, get help. Um, um, so ASL tutor, right? Uh, we'll pay mm -hmm. a good ASL tutor a lot of money because it, first of all, I have that human connection. So that is just amazing. It's worth the money. Um, right. I'm working now with a, a voice teacher who is amazing, and, and that, I have to say, is one of the most vulnerable and difficult things um, I've done, and finding the right person who could guide me through that um, is just so valuable, and it's something reassuring about taking it out of your own responsibility or your hands, right, and saying, okay, here, Betty Ann, I'm making myself vulnerable. I'm handing it all over to you. Just tell me what to do. Help, right? Um, it's hard to do that. Very hard. So I know that I've said, okay, be rigid and, and be organized, but yet, you know, completely give up control. Um, so maybe it's a delicate balance between the two. So um, there was a question asked um, that now that you can hear, um, curious to know if you yeah. still prefer to read information or if you would prefer to listen. Um, how do you prefer to receive information now? That is a great question. So I always have to say, you know, here with air quotes, because this is definitely not like I have a feeling that if you heard what I'm hearing, you would just say that is disgusting and that is horrible. But for me, it's beautiful. So I always have to say here, we're tricking my brain into hearing. Um, and it is beautiful. I still have some of that, that sense of synesthesia, you know, that I talked about. Um, it's funny. It, um, I think, I think this is a human nature thing. Um, have my tiny, tiny on all day, tiny brain computer, my hearing hardware. And it's just like, oh, so much noise. And it's so nice to take it off, you know, like the tight bra, or the shoes or something, <laughs> take it off at the end of the day. Oh, it's just quiet silence, right? Where I retreat to myself and just read or, you know, just be in nature. And then I'm like, but where are all the noises in the world? Now I know <laughs> there are all these noises. Where are the birds? Where are the things? And then I, you know, I missed it and I put them back on and whoosh then. So I think no matter what, I'm always appreciating um, jumping between those worlds. Mm -hmm. I think I'm always going to enjoy written English because I feel in some ways that's my native language, even more than spoken mm -hmm. English. Um, but boy, sound is beautiful. Music is just, just amazing. People's voices, amazing. So I will never tire of the novelty of that. How about that? No, that's a great answer. Um, and I think another question would be, is there anything that we can do um, to communicate better with those who are hearing impaired? And I know that I work mm -hmm. with you a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So I know some of the things that um, make it easier for you to participate um, yeah. that we may or may not have thought of before that we might take for granted. And, and sometimes I feel like we miss accommodations yeah. that we should be thinking of um, right. when we are hosting these webinars and things like that. Is there anything that you can share with us that makes mm. it easier for you? That, that is a great question. So um, first of all, um, I don't think should, things that we should be doing, I don't know about that, that bird well, should, can. because yeah, it, no, but um, everyone's deafness is different. So if I had grown mm -hmm. up native in ASL, then I would prefer not to have captioning, I prefer to have someone in the signing for this. So um, everyone's needs are going to be a little different. So I think creating the sort of space where people feel comfortable coming and saying, you know, what mm -hmm. would really make this experience top notch for me is if you had an ASL interpreter um, mm -hmm. or captioning or um, could, 
you make sure that you describe your background, right? So if you're low vision, sometimes it's nice for me to be able to describe myself and my background and, and what I'm seeing. So things like that, to be able to uh, give people the freedom and, uh, and be comfortable coming forward and saying, hey, this is, this is really um, what I would what I would like. Um, and it, it's hard to do that, but I think um, you can signal that in a lot of ways. And I think signaling, just like you have here, like we had a request and, and we're doing this. And so that hopefully will allow other people who have requests or needs to put that in. I also want, because I know um, it's hard, some people get tripped off. I started out by saying, what do I call myself? And I didn't say what I want you to call me. And I know people say, oh, hearing, in, Paired or hearing challenges, or um, I've spoken a lot with people with different kinds of disabilities, and we all agree that it's awkward, and we don't know what to call each other, and other people don't know how to describe us, and don't let that awkwardness over whatever my differences may be, or whatever words you know I use to describe myself. Um, uh, don't worry about that. Don't allow that to get in the way of this human connection. Um, doing your best, being open and curious and warm and wanting to meet me halfway um, is so valuable. It makes up for so much. Um, so I just wanted to put that in there. And, and for people with disabilities that I've talked to, they, they agree with that, that it can be um, awkward. But just go ahead. Don't, don't be afraid of that. So really, you know, I'm hearing that it would it's just most important to create a safe space where people feel comfortable advocating for themselves or asking for what they need because everybody's need might be slightly different. Yes. Um, and really having that safe space or environment where they feel comfortable to do that is, is maybe the most important thing. Yeah, so that's yeah. a great point. Um, so another question was, what drew you to journalism, especially considering that it's largely based around listening? What was your draw? Why, why was your passion journalism? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's that communication thing. I think my brain um, is just desperately, I was always, um, you know, felt isolated and confused about what's going on around the world. So what is my solution to that? I'm going to learn about the world and I'm going to, I'm going to explain it to other people. And it's in a, a way that I can control um, because it's written English and it's me giving them the information, but I love it when readers would, would write to me or respond to, to what I had, had written. Um, so it's a form of communication you know, mm -hmm. in a channel that I could manage. And I love connecting with people. I love hearing people's stories. I love listening to people's stories. I can't hear them. <laughs> I can hear them better now. Um, um, and there's something that is so much fun about interviewing a researcher and finding out what makes them tick and figuring out how to get that nugget of that out and share that with other people. Um, other people, but I know a, a lot of oral deaf people are terrific writers. And I think for that reason, it kind of uh, turns you inward and, and playing with language in a different mm -hmm. way. Um, we had an, a stats question come in. Um, so speaking of stats, how many, how, what is the percentage of um, people who get uh, synesthesia after a cochlear impa implant? Do you have that, yeah. um, that statistic? Yeah. It, um, it, um, it is, is very small. I've never met someone else who has had that. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because um, I'm going around yeah, it was on Facebook. Oh, um, so we had something, I think, in the resources or the Q&A that we can drop in for more information about my cochlear implant. I think, um, they, did. So I think they dropped that in to the Okay, to good. The okay. That, that had some stuff that I wrote at the time, just sharing with my Facebook friends. Um, so uh, I haven't met anyone else that has encountered that. So that might be my unique brain. I know mm -hmm. that... Uh, people's brains do tend to remap if they are, um, you know, prelingually deaf or congenitally deaf, you know, where they're, they're missing the sounds in there. Mm -hmm. The thing is, they often are missing all their sounds. And when they try to communicate to people, hey, I'm getting this, you know, this weird feeling in my head, but no sound, I think well-meaning, but ill-advised specialists would say, oh, that's just sound. You don't know what sound is and, and maybe be a little patronizing. So I had the ability of kind of having a foot in both worlds where I knew what sound mm -hmm. sounded like and I knew that it's synesthesia, weird stuff was not, was not normal. So I don't know, let's go do a study. Anyone here want to do a study with me? <laughs> 
Um, and then, so are there, um, let me pull up the next question here. Um, it, are there any challenges that you're currently facing right now that you've not discussed? Um, even aside from this, are there any current challenges that you're facing right now? Um, and if none, what could be the next challenge that would excite you? So maybe <laughs> the study here. Um, right, 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 right. Um, you know, I've been so vulnerable already. I'll just go ahead and say working with my voice coach, um, mm. sp speech is one of the things that is uh, so, so sensitive to deaf people, even deaf people mm -hmm. even have a hard time talking to each other about um, speech. And um, I decided at some point I wanted, um, I had lots of people always asking about my deaf accent and asking what country I was from. And I would kind of guess all these Eastern European countries um, and say, no, I'm from Deaflandia. Um, and, and finally, once I kind of got that cochlear implant under control, I, I said, all right, let, let's see if I can do this. And, and you know, all these other accomplishments that I've had in my life were a bit of a source of sense. So I, I thought, you know, when I put my mind to it, I figured out how to do this. I figured out how to be a journalist. I figured out how to teach statistics and sign language. So maybe I can do this. Let's see. Maybe I can't. We'll find out. Um, so that, um, that has produced many, many tears. Um, I've been doing this for maybe about a year and, um, it's exceedingly difficult and exceedingly rewarding and exciting. I'll just leave it at that. That's great. Thanks, Regina. Um, I, it looks like this is probably the last question, um, that we have time for today. Um, but could you share what your favorite project has been so far that you've worked on? Ooh, oh, pick one. Oh, you guys, don't make me. <laughs> you have to pick one. one. <laughs> oh, but now I feel the immense pressure for it to be meaningful and to completely sum up all the threads and themes that I have been talking about today. And um, that is just not um, true. Okay, how about this? I'll go completely geeky completely different direction. Um, a few years ago, I wrote uh, a piece for Nature about p-values. So anyone in the audience, if you know anything about science or statistics, you know p less than 0.05, and that's the only thing you remember from stats. And I wrote this great piece in Nature um, about why it's not really what you think it is. And um, that spawned, um, not that, it was the right place, right time, but that, um, got a lot of attention and started a conversation about what are we doing with p-values? Are we relying on them too much? Uh, I don't want to overstate my place in that, but um, it was poised for that. Um, so uh, I don't know how to drop that easily in the chat, but let's just say p-values because it doesn't have anything to do with anything else in my life. It was just pure stats geekiness. <laughs> Okay, I think that's the last question that we have time for today. Um, we'll have to wrap up the webinar, um, but I wanna thank you again, Regina, for sharing your personal journey with us today. It was really inspirational and we really appreciate your vulnerability on this call today. Um, and I hope everyone on the call um, has enjoyed this as well. Um, to everyone in our audience today, a link to the recording of the session will be emailed to you soon. So you'll receive an on-demand link. Um, so feel free to revisit the content. And again, thank you, Regina, and we wish you all a great week and we hope to see you all again in future sessions. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.